Hello everyone, today we talk about Frankish infantry between the 3rd and the 6th century, of course AD. Uh, we will concentrate naturally on the whole uh, Frankish warriorhood uh, in general as distinguishing, you know, cavalry from infantry uh, at a certain level during the migration era it doesn't have quite much of a sense, like obviously uh, it does reflect uh, political and social segmentation it's obvious that you know fighting on horseback is something that you know only uh, someone who can afford that, uh, in fact, can do. But at the same time, not all cavalry is alike, and the uh, activity of um, you know these Germanic warriors on the battlefield was really much more flexible than than we think. It's not just their their own thing, right? This is this could be said in many ways throughout all. Um, especially ancient and medieval history, especially in this tribal context, where of course you know you could be you know poor at the point that you could not afford to maintain a horse on a war horse on a, on a regular basis, or just not even just a runner, right? But you actually knew how to 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 ride one and to um, to make acrobacies on it and so on at some levels, right? And um, the the important here is getting the balance right. I mean the trying to understand what unfortunately the historical archaeological datum cannot give us so you know readily and and precisely but that is obviously related to the a completely different physicality and mindset from the uh, from, from our own times right we tend to look at this warfare in in a kind of mechanicistic if you want and you know categorical way but actually we're talking both about something more simple and yet more, uh, you know, bearing than than we're used to th to think in uh, war in a war gamistic sense. I always make this kind of premises because you know when I you know you read a title Frankish infantry like you know who knows which kind of specificity there's going to be here right about the fact these were Franks. They were uh, talking about infantry, so it must be something so special and unique. Well, actually, no. We're talking about things that basically every single tribal people out there was capable of doing in a way or another, right? Especially in here in this fundamentally sedentary world. Yes, these populations could be uh, defined as still as semi-nomadic in, in, in the measure in which they, they moved. But you know that fundamentally the Western Germans were, were the ones that... In, you know, in Germanic terms, traveled the least, right? But at the same time, as we will see here, that there is this prejudice uh, attributed to them, for which you know they had a very few cavalry. They weren't very influenced by, you know, the the culture of the steppes. They were mostly like a, a Roman creation. Well, we'll we'll see that. Uh, I mean, from a military point of view, this is in, in a way reality. Like the the the, wet, the peoples, especially like the Franks, the Alamanni really grew and developed their military systems at the, in the migration era through the Roman army. I mean, literally within the Roman army, right? Of course, they had a tribal warfare, but what we see at this point, especially from the 5th century onwards, was fundamentally um, modification, or at least transformation of the, the, the Roman military that actually fought by that point in the same exact way, in fact, right? But there is also the, this Eastern influence that must be taken into consideration and uh, and for which we cannot say, right, on the base of a, you know, somewhat superficial interpretation of certain quotes by certain authors that were trying, by the way, to, you know, very schematically and ideally dealing with the, with the, with the topic, think that, I don't know, the, the Franks didn't have much of a cavalry, for example, or that they made um, m more use of infantry in general, or they didn't use the bow particularly uh, compared to other peoples. I mean, this may be true once again if you compare them, of course, with peoples like I don't know the Longbirds or, or the Goths, or you know these, these peoples that at, at some point had a, an evidently steps um, face, we could say, right? But if you look even further west, right, and if you look at the same Roman army in general, you, you don't see much of a, you know, of, of a difference. The point is that mostly the archaeological finds tell us that, you know, the, 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 the material culture, the migration here, was, was after all very, very homogeneous in many ways. Uh, the Franks, especially from the 5th, the 6th century, 
come to dominate in this broader area that encompasses, in fact, up to the Loire River, to the River Ems in Germany, and uh, the, the World Thuringian area, in which fall, broadly speaking, at that point, mostly old Western Europe, right? But um, archaeology, and also for the previous centuries, um, does show us, you know, uh, differences, surely the presence of the Steps culture, but as, as it often happens, uh, using a certain type of, of, of weaponry or, or armor doesn't actually mean to be fighting with the same tactics of, of another people, right? This, this is too complicated, this is a too mechanistic explanation. We have explained a lot of times actually how weapons do not make tactics, contrary to what people you know, come up with, like thinking, oh, look at machine guns, they were World War the First. This, is, this means having literally no idea of what, what we're talking about. Um, and um, especially at this point, actually, where societies were, were simpler, we can't easily see what, what's the deal there, how and, and, and why, you know, there were, for example, horse archers all over, all over Western Europe. But, of course, the, the East didn't play the same role that uh, it had in Eastern Europe at that time. Um, and it's a matter of political and social structures that should be analyzed. Today we concentrate, in fact, more gamistically at the end of the day, on, on Frankish infantry. Always bearing in mind, in fact, what what this really, what this means broadly speaking, um, and therefore we're talking about a type of infantry was largely common, and um, to, to to all the other Germanic and also many other peoples, frankly, um, frankly, you know, talking about the Franks, I will I, that's an adverb I use frequently, so it's kind of weird in this context, but you know. Um, that's how impacting, in fact, the Franks in many ways uh, have been uh, in our in our culture in, in Europe in general, um, and 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 we have to understand, in fact, for this very reason, how it's a paradox that um, the people that is credited with having made the least use of, of infantry amongst amongst the Germans is actually the one that, once settled in Gaul, will begin quite early, actually, to augment its cavalry contingents, um, and therefore this view that, you know, the fundamentally the Franks kept fighting in, in the same kind of tribal, mostly um, on foot, um, uh, based uh, way up to the, the mid-8th century with the, with the Carolingian reforms that rejected cavalry, where um, it's it, it's, a, it's a brutal approximation. Actually, what the Carolingians did later on was to and definitely strengthened something that was already taking place, right, and definitely developing it in a measure that was unprecedented. Um, and there are objectively many other digressions we could make, for example, of how in the St. Carolingian era, where objectively the Franks had best cavalry around in Western Europe, um, still the, the, the tradition of the St. Franks was to tribe it to peoples like the, the, the Visigoths and the Longobards that were still around, um, actually, the, the the primacy in equestrian skills and tradition compared to the Franks, that, however, were at this point actually surpassing, had already surpassed them. Because, um, in a way, it is true that during the migration era, it, this was generally the trend. But we, we should try to understand better how and why uh, th this would happen. Uh, yes, we speak of cavalry, even though focusing on infantry, because it, it, it really, you know, uh, these arms are complementary, so you can't really do without one another. We will definitely talk about Frankish cavalry in another video, um, similar to this. Um, but the whole point, I would start actually from, from the mindset of these warriors. Well, what is that we, we know about the Franks as a people that, despite having fought actually within the, the, under you know, the Roman command, for centuries, right, and even here, big digression, we were the Franks, right, um, we've made a lot of videos about them, but, you know, we can talk about this originally in Javonian uh, people that uh, was actually more or less the same tribes, the the, the Kati, for example, the Sugambri, all the, these peoples that, that were the same guys who basically crushed the, the, the Roman legions about the Tudorburg force, right? They were all the same peoples, but re-edited in a way. We actually have extensive evidence of this on the base of the same Roman sources. You know, think about even the Tabula Peutingeriana, or, you know, all these correspondences that actually exist between, I don't know, the, the Catuari, for example, and the Franks, you know, about the same etymology of the Franks. The, these were conf 
com confederative names. As you know, these were mm, during the migration era. There's this the, the, the Germanic tribes, as many others passed to you know this broader systems that give themselves a name that actually has nothing to do is very generic has nothing to do with the original name of the tr single tribes that kept for for a while to call themselves uh, in in the old way franks is of, often translated and i think i said it too very, very often in the videos as the freemen right so that the same term is used today but uh, some say it actually means fears, like there are connections, for example, even with the spear, the, the jowl, I think the, the frack of the, you know, the Norse size, things like these. Um, and uh, so th this kind of aggressive, you know, minded population, it, it definitely matches with the military culture of the Franks, in the way we can we can see it. Um, and there is a bit this the stereotype, which is actually not far from the truth. About the fact that the Franks were somewhat some of the wildest of the of the Germanic peoples, the fact that these tribes had uh, lived for half of a millennium uh, next door to the Romans had definitely brought some changes in their ways of life in their uh, military culture. But you know, as long as they remained across the Rhine, they hadn't you know changed in the essentials who who, who they were. Right in terms of primitive societies, fundamentally speaking. I mean, if you look at the Goths, for example. Well, those on the long run went, went on, a, on a way of, of, of civilization, but possibly, you know, um, not so with su such a dramatic um, uh, distance from the Franks in this regard, but, but still had a, another, you know, um, also institutional path. It's possible that Alaric I even somewhat influenced Clovis and its uh, kind of uh, revolutionary turn in Frankish politics that was you know, some of the most egalitarian out there, Clovis transforms the Franks in, in, into a, a, a dynastic monarch, in a private dominion, basically, which the other Germans actually do not do not achieve. And it was something completely opposite to their um, to, to, to their view. So a uh, lot a lot of things happens, but objectively the Franks that come, you know, to to appear as actually an individual, you know, and autonomous polities by the the early 1450s in Roman Gaul, all these, you know, fundamentally originating from bands of mercenaries, right, you know, they were, like, literally come out of the forest the day before, right, this is the picture that we get, right, the, the Germans, as we've talked about this, we've made many videos on how, you know, the, the same idea of Germanic peoples is fundamentally a, a, a Roman ethnographic invention. Like the, these peoples didn't conceive themselves as such. They probably recognized they had something in common, but they, you know, they were after all, as we were saying before, not not even concretely, you know, different from from many other groups here. So uh, in Central Europe, so the the general picture we get from here is of a of a path of acculturation that passes for the Franks through the Roman army proper and that does maintain a kind of a military character essentially on the wake of the same Roman military uh, you know organization uh, and even infrastructures right in, in a way when these people settle in Gaul right um, they settle in the, the, the Gallia Belgica so fundamentally in the, the north of today's northeastern France and Benelux um, up to the, the the you know up to the Rhine, right? That was the the border between Gaul and Germany at the time, um, and the, the these were areas that uh, were possibly, especially towards today's north northeastern France, even more urbanized with, than we think. The Franks definitely appreciate in a, in a way that cities, albeit they do not really center their government on it, but for for the rest, especially towards the the, the border with Germany. Um, this were this was a province that had gone under, you know, depopulated over time, and the reason why the, the Romans m more or less allowed or let, in some other occasion, the Franks to settle and this area because ob objectively there was nobody, um, nobody else out there. And the Romans, as you know, had always been, you know, deported and uh, resettled and sometimes wiped out all of these uh, populations on the borders. Um, for the sake of agricultural, you know, production of them transforming these warriors in, in, in eventually captured as slaves when they were not slaughtered and settled as peasants, right? Um, and there is a process also in this regard. Um, after the, 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 the beginning of the 5th century, basically the Franks were actually some of the 
the, the best friends of the Romans, uh, let, let's see it in this way, um, albeit they, they were actually not much better oriented you know, than, than other Germans, in, as it's, it's believed, right? And fundamentally, it was just a political mm, contingency uh, for which the Franks were used as a sort of, of, of shield of buffer um, uh, people, say, polity, um, to, to try to stem all the push of these other Germanic peoples. So at some point, a breakthrough, and, and that's where the same Franks that had initially tried to uh, stem them say, okay, well, screw this, I, I'll settle myself, take my piece of cake in here in Gaul myself. And then that's fundamentally how the Franks enter, like, properly, you know, deep into the, in the Roman interland, and they... Um, they they begin to interact naturally also with the local populations, especially also in the areas that were more populated, right? Uh, the, the the Rhineland went quickly Germanized, right? Other areas not, also because the Franks, as you know, began at some point to speak Romance, and you know, France speaks uh, a Romance language even today, and that does stem from from probably the Frankish North. Um, and the the idea is that there is definitely a segmentation. Think about the one between Neustria and Austrasia, for example, it will be a big deal. We talked about it also on the video on the Carolingian conquest of Saxony. Um, and uh, But it's obvious that what we we should start to think the thing like is that basically the Franks were becoming Roman soldiers in, in the measure in which the, the Roman institutions of Gaul fundamentally were not destroyed, right? The uh, Gaul has this peculiarity that we have observed many times which, you know, in spite of the ravaging it and, and so on, you know, it was never like raised to the ground at some point, right? Um, a bit like Spain in a way, you know, uh, Britain or Italy at some point were raised to the ground. Um, these areas were not, and and Gaul was very important for the Romans, especially from a military point of view, because that's where, as you know, for 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 centuries, uh, the empire has stationed, uh, you know, uh, basically the largest military force of the empire along the Rhine, and this was um, naturally served by lots of infrastructures, a lot of latifundia that um, passed basically intact, you know, where another, you know definitely with the, the transformations of late antiquity into the hands of the Franks, that as soon as they settle, objectively, immediately substitute themselves to, to the pre-existing order, actually they mix with the Roman Gallic senatorial elite. They become one thing, and, and, and this is a highly aristocratic society that basically um, gets married with, you know, the Clovis, you know, political and institutional model, and that naturally, you know, Breaks from you know the 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 the, and the tribal Frankish tradition that, however, leaves on actually for a lot of years, many communities for for centuries, right? And we're not talking just about you know the much of military traditions, but literally you know religion, right? Most of the Franks actually remained pagan for centuries, even after you know Clovis converted to Christianity and and perfectly. Uh, perfectly built a, a Christian, a truly Christian monarchy, but that's at the institutional level. At, at the level of the population, uh, most of the people right change very slowly. We know at the beginning of the seventh century, the Franks still made human sacrifices. Right, you know these kind of things that horrified the papacy at that time was still, you know, however allied basically with with the Franks because the you know the alliance between the alliance between Rome and the Franks basically with the evaporation of the western half of the empire, basically remained with, with, with the papal Rome and the Catholics in general against the Aryans, such as the Goths, the Longobards, and so on. Um, and, and, you know, all things we've we already seen. Um, and the, the, the path to, to this was somewhat gradual, so we, we can't immediately see that the, the Franks, as soon as they settle in Gaul, they, they occupy... Um, you know, roles that, that that had been one of the previous Roman military, right? The, the Germanic bands were called as contubernia in the early Frankish law, for example. The, the contubernium was literally, you know, the the, 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 the the Roman unit of eight or more that shared the same tent. Um, and we can't see even the, the degree of fragmentation that probably had characterized the early uh, the early Frankish move. Right, uh, because eventually the, the various lords and uh, 
you know, Frankish principalities that formed in northeastern, today's northeastern France, Belgium, were already a product of the Germanic superimposition to the pre-existing uh, seigneurial structures of Roman Gaul. Uh, that had undergone a privatization of warfare that fundamentally will be, you know, the standard in, in, in Frankish world up to, you know, literally the French Revolution, because let's be honest about this, that that's what the, the, the thing was based on, the real deal of feudalism, it's about the idea that there's no really, a, 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 you know, a central authority, like a, a public authority, right, everything is in the hands of who has gotten that through, through war. Right, and this um, seigneurial and, and militarized, mil warlike mentality, in a way, um, that characterizes since the beginning Frankish uh, expansionism. Right, these guys create effectively an empire by, by, with Clovis because they don't just rule over the Franks, not just the Frankish kingdom, like it could be, you know, the, the Visigothic kingdom, the Ostrogothic kingdom, the Longobard kingdom. No, these guys basically come to rule over other entities, such as the Aquitanians, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, the Turinches. I mean, they, they really expand up to Bavaria in, in, into this uh, properly imperialistic uh, fashion. And today we stop actually to, to the 6th century, of course, we will you know point out, given the scarcity of, of references, um, something from, you know, later times. But uh, fundamentally... Um, the the sixth century is the moment in which the, the, you can't see the, the greater exp the greatest expansion of Merovingian power uh, before crumbling fundamentally actually in the same end of the century uh, to this private uh, idea that uh, you know that there is not properly a state but a private possession right and therefore uh, after each generation uh, the the, the sons of, of the king split the domain and start fighting against each other and this is what brings effectively the Merovingian power to crumble to, throughout the 7th century. Basically at the end of the 7th century there's not a, a Frankish kingdom anymore, right? It takes the Carolingians to, to, to rebuild the thing from scratch uh, in many ways, especially in terms of military power, right? Um, we also, I think, we made a video on Frankish military organization at this time, um, the Merovingian army, yes. Uh, so, we, if you're interested, you can go look at that video, it's in the Frankish history playlist, and we, we also explain most of the stuff here. Um, but, th there is also this phase uh, of previous um, employment in, in Roman service before the, you know, the, the, the mass settlement of the Franks in Gaul, right? For example, in 361 AD, Emperor Julian raised troops among the Franks in the Alamanni and created these units that we have seen also in, in the video on the Battle of Strasbourg where they were employed. Uh, six new Auxilia Palatina units in three pairs, naming uh, one pair to Bantes Sali, that ha has, is named after two Frankish tribes, you know, the Salians, you know, were also the Ripuarians from the other side. Uh, Tubantas means he's literally using, you know, the war horns, right? So that was the, you know, as we will see now, the, we will look at the the sonority of, of, of the battlefield and the Frankish military traditions in line with what actually the sensorial experience of warfare was at the time at large. We have completely removed uh, from from the from our horizons. Um, and then to the other two pairs, the emperor gave non-tribal names such as the Grati Augustae, right? So uh, the grateful uh, Augusts and um, Felicas Invicti, right? So the happy, prosper, and undefeated. Um, and of these latter pairs, three units and perhaps original four bore images of bucks or wolves on their shields, right? As you can be seen actually from the Notitia Dignitatum we made a uh, or Notitia Dignitatum by that time in ecclesiastical pronunciation uh, we made a video on to this government handbook that lists all you know the various uh, emblems so the, the various uh, units in this between fundamentally the end of the fourth beginning of the fifth century um, this is I mean, this thing of the wolf warriorhood is an important mm, step to start from I think. Because even before the equipment, all the, the passages from Procopius, Agatius, the famous Angon, etc., the Francisca, uh, the, uh, the mindset is probably the single most important thing ever in warfare. You know, moral forces is fundamentally what, what war is about. Uh, and the, the, the tradition of 
well, think about the Ulfetnar, right? That we mostly remember because of Norse society, etc. It, it's literally all, all over the world. Like every single tribal reality that lived in a place where there were wolves, like for, you know, from the, 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 the Eurasian steppes, North America, they, they all use the, the, the wolf warriorhood things in the same identical way. It's no Norse prerogatives, no Germanic prerogative. And, and it shows this, um, you know, lifestyle it was described many times that actually has to do specifically with the comitatus, with the Latin called, the Latins called the, the comitatus, right? So opposed to the zip, uh, right? And the, you know, the village, the, you know, agricultural community. This idea of this wandering bands of uh, young, I could say disturbed the young men because this is what the thing was really about. Like these were fundamentally military professionals that lived out there in the wilderness or in the service of some, you know, uh, employer that went out for for fortune, right? Uh, theoretically, for for land and women, right? That they couldn't find in their own homeland. That was a way to to basically get them out of the way, if, uh, you know, for, for local society in order not to trigger, you know, this ferocious. Um, you know, fighters that, that broke out constantly all over, you know, the Germanic or the tribal societies in general, because there were no, no enough resources for everybody, right, you know, um, and this was the only way, this had, the, the Romans had done the same thing in a way, whether you think the Roman Sheewolf actually comes from, it's the same exact uh, warlike background, um, and um, you can see it uh, in this in this emblems like the symbols of wolves of these um, wandering semi-nomadic and necrophagos, by the way, uh, animals that were connected naturally with the idea of you know the, this you know the afterlife of where the warriors went you know this you know kind of medium between the the, the world of the living the world of the dead, uh, Volden, right the. Uh, the crowd, the the same thing with Odin, the, the, in in time perspective, uh, that uh, that naturally was what all this properly military slash magical side of the story really was. You know, Thor, these other kind of Herculean figures are, you know, an emblem of you know manhood in the sense of you know of vitality, etc. But properly, the the military. Uh, the military god is uh, the, the old man, the, this, the, this, you know, uh, spirit, this entity that lives between, in fact, in the world of the living, the world of the dead, that passes through the rooms, and this, um, and that fundamentally inspires in the sort of possession the warriors to become, you know, the the the, the winners in this regard. I mean, the the whole thing is oriented towards the fact that you know the. The deity of the sky in here uh, turn, in, infuses into the the warriors this spirit that reflects the same deity of war that these guys are voted to, and and these guys once they enter in, in that state they, they they're not out of it anymore. Like this this was not a choice. Like if you entered in one of these bands, you were signed uh, forever, right? You know we we don't know how the Romans have actually coped with these guys because then we know that. Since Trajan, you know, the, the Roman armies actually hired these wolf warriors, and it would be very interesting to see how they found some common ground, in spite of the, you know the the mass of the sheer mass of the civilization, you know, divide uh, difference. That the you know that, however, were evidently useful in many ways, and and German warriors had been out there. Uh, in the Roman army since time of Caesar, right? You know this idea that the Germans somewhat, you know, you know, came out of Central Europe since the, the third century, or maybe the the, yeah, the second half of the second, and that before, you know, they aside from of the Teutonic migrations, etc., but they had been contained by the Romans as if they, they had not known what was out there. Is is nonsense? You know, think about Hermann was 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 educating Rome. I mean, the, the Germans knew what the empire was, and they went regularly to serve the Roman armies as mercenaries, right? And very proudly, right, by the way, coming back home when the service was over. And it would be very, really very interesting to see how these military bands, in fact, interacted with, uh, you know, the, the, in fact, the concept of the comitatus and the zip, how the, the wolf warrior them um, actually... You know, coped with the you know the the, the c some civilized one, the one of the village, the one of the kings, the one of the you know of the non-possessed world, um, in many ways.
but it seems that in Frankish society this thing was dominant for, for, for a long time, right? That until you know the, the, the monarchy took over and managed to, to impose you know the, at least a, a civilized way in, 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 along Christian um, standards, at least uh, the thing was very widespread in this war. It was really um, the, the the norm, and it it went on for for a lot of years, and we have l looked at. Uh, very often how the, this thing never extinguished itself, not even in the Middle Ages. Like, you know, what do you think of, I don't know, a 13th century uh, knight, right, a European knight, it's, it's still imbued with this thing. Aside from the chivalric models, etc., you know, the same degree of violence or fury, in part, was, uh, I'd like to mitigate, it was, was still there, right? The, the, that's proper also, considering what these guys have to do. Individually speaking, but the promise, the the, the effort, the the, the 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 psychic side of the story that that is something that we can't really understand anymore at this point in history because we have secularized to match the thing, and it's naturally not functional to the way we make war anymore. That always contains that in terms of you know primitive, you know enmity and you know this instinctual side of, of violence, but. Um, it's, it's still, you know, we don't live it through cultural structures, you know, tra traditions, etc. anymore. For these people, instead, it was normality, right? Together with a life side that was one nightmarish, to, to say the least. Um, we, we know that though by uh, 590 AD, at the end of our period, the very end, um, the, the name was still basically uh, no longer bound, Right, uh, Cadinus to Vault, and it echoes uh, wolf warriordom among the Franks, of which we otherwise knew next to nothing, were if not for Pope Gregory the Great, who in 597 AD railed against Frankish cultic sacrifices done by men wearing animal heads. Right, the same. It's the same thing. It was the same cults. It was the same that the world. Think of the the the, the war the, the warrior band was, was tied to to the religious side of the story, right? It was all one. This uh, you know war was an exclusively uh, religious business. Uh, it was like all the existence, by the way, right? You know, um, and uh, and what we can see though is that the Frankish fighting customs may have changed little in practice, right? It was still a fury. Uh, documented, for example, for a certain Ursio in 587. Uh, this is a story told by Gregory of Tours in the history of the Franks, um, in which um, King Kittelbert's army cornered this rebel and his men in a church, right, on a mountain near Verdun, and the king's men, unable to force their way into the building, set it afire. So at this point, quote, when Ursio saw this, he girt himself with his sword, came out, and began such a slaughter among the besiegers that no one who showed himself stayed alive. There fell, uh, tr fell Trudolf, count of the royal palace, and many of that army were cut down. When Ursio finally tried, uh, tired of, of, uh, of the slaughter, someone hit him in the leg. Weakened, he sank to the ground, and as others ran up, lost his life. Right, so this is something that could easily happen, even you know, if the dual uh, wolf warrior dom thing wasn't around. But the behavior, right, this you know suicidal sortie to, to try to, to break against the enemy that, however, overran him, and and he slaughtered, you know, as we've seen here, even the count of royal palace. So we're sure we're talking about the elite of, of of the of the Merovingian army, right? It really shows you what these men were capable of doing, just in terms. of of, of psychophysical standards, like the idea, okay, you know, I'm dead, I'm going to bring down as many as possible, and this is not just said by, you know, exploding, making a click, this is you have to take them down one by one, and, and killing someone is not easy, right, you know, even if they are, you know, the, maybe they don't have much of an armor, which in this case actually is even not uh, true, but really you have to get there, the, the guy's going to defend it, you have to, to literally smash him down, Right, and and the thing is 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 violent at a level that we can't properly understand at at this point exactly because we have lost that even that way of killing properly, uh, in our own wars, and we don't have that. Uh, you see, that was the only mean to do the thing, 
in a world, you know, it's not that there is a tank, an helicopter, can't knock things out. You know, the, the, the worst thing you can see in front of you is, is a band of, you know, armored troops that are, at this point, you know, starts appearing even in Gaul under the Franks in, uh, you know, as we will see now with the gradual professionalization of the, uh, these military bands. Uh, and who can stop them? Who can stop them? Right? It's literally the, the greatest force you can find out there. Right? Unless, you know, yeah, the army of a more kind of a universal uh, empire uh, shows up. But at this time, actually, even the Byzantines were, weren't that far from the same models of, uh, you know, broadly speaking, uh, by gr gross standards, very different. Right? We find other episodes, though, e in the previous times. Right? For example, in AD 296, relatively to armor. Right, how many Franks uh, did actually wear armor at this point? You know, probably a few, right? Uh, there is, as we all see, this stereotype for which Franks were depicted as, you know, essentially savages, right? Which they were something at least barely more, uh, not much far from it, <laughs> frankly. But um, uh, that, for this reason, they, they didn't have much of uh, protection, they were somewhat uh, primitive. Uh, many people say, oh, well, you know, this may be a stereotype, etc., but we're talking about 5th, 6th century continental Europe. You can imagine how poor material culture could be. You know, the same Roman army against the Goths in Italy made, you know, wooden armor, right? Which still works in a way. Uh, but you can imagine in this areas that were the ones, especially in northern Gaul, to go more depopulated and, and you know, also economically contracted, you know, the, the availability of, of metals, right? Um, and Albike, you know, objectively, the main metallurgical centers in Europe at this point were shifting from the north to the to the middle, right, to the upper Rhine, right? So the Franks actually came to encompass, as we've seen before, this broader um, uh, armor production, right? You know, still the average uh, Frankish warrior, who was incidentally an infantryman in this regard, had little, if actually no armor, right? We know of helmets being, you know, somewhat uh, common. And of course, you know, uh, head protection is, is the thing you really want to have the most, uh, right? This is something that reconstructions of, often do not take inadequate consideration because maybe the, the source doesn't tell it. But, you know, if you're going to, to battle, the, literally the, the first thing you want to protect is your head, right? You can't be, you know, defenseless. Uh, anywhere else in your body, but your head comes first. Um, and still, we, we can naturally uh, think that the, the, the elite, as we will see in a while, had very elaborated armor, which, is, which turn, turns out to be the case. But in this case, the elite is going to be more likely, actually, the, the mounted one, or at least better, the one that uh, used to fight... Uh, you know, both mounted or dismounted, but that mostly made up what we called cavalry on, on you know, in, in a proper sense. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means that actually it's typical of the migration era to see still a, you know, a prevalence of infantry, right, among the various arms uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of tactical superiority, right? The, uh, that infantry still had the upper hand, right? There is a, being a bit of a historiographical current distressed how much since the times of the Huns, or the, you know, and all these, you know, steps, peoples that came alongside with them, you know, uh, the the influence of uh, mounted warfare somewhat came dominant, right? If you look at the 6th century, you can see, if you look at Belisarius' armies, for example, the ones of the Reconquest, uh, you know, the same ones that after some decade would still fight, for example, alongside the Franks against the Longobards, etc., had an important amount of cavalry, and, and the whole thing was fought in that way, but that was mostly a, a strategical need than a tactical one, right? And we know constantly of troops dismounting, uh, if they could. Also, because in these military cultures, actually fighting on horseback was starting to, to be something, you know, mm, you know, obviously attached to status, and political power, etc., but was still believed, if you want in a democratic sense, as long as, you know, the, the freemen uh, counted something, uh, which in Gaul, objectively, did did not is quickly, uh, after Frankish settlement, um, you know, fighting, you know, 
just being on horseback during battle uh, was for cowards, right? This is something that was out there among the, the Germans, among the Celts, uh, back in you know the Iron Age, like if if you are on horseback, you can't flee. We've seen at the Battle of Strasbourg. We were talking actually about the same units we were talking recruited by Julian before. How you know the the, the Germanic infantry, the Alemannic infantry began to shout to the their nobility that was mounted to dismount to start fighting alongside with them in, in the in the let's call them the phalanx because actually you know in Greek that's what you know, the Greeks called them the barbarian formations like, even though they have, of course, nothing to do with what we have categorized and standardized as, you know, what they call the phalanx. Um, and we'll see later better. Um, so, uh, this naturally was paralleled by the fact that, as we've seen, cavalry wouldn't become the, the superior arm so for a while. Right. Um, actually, in Europe, you really want to see that happening. I mean, at least in you know, uh, the lands previously occupied by the Roman Empire. Objectively, goal is where you you start seeing it happening more more than else. But it generally was the the World War at that time that uh, was was heading towards that direction. But the, the base was still you know we we still don't have enough cavalry, for example, to 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 defeat. Um, just through it. Cavalry still doesn't have the devastating impact it will start gaining from the 8, very gradually, by the way, uh, up to around to, to the 12th, especially the 13th century, where really there is nobody who can challenge uh, cavalry uh, in open field in, in Western Europe. So then the thing starts uh, changing again in the, other, in the opposite direction by the 14th century. So just for saying how you know, of course, infantry is a bit the overlooked uh, side of the story most of the times, um, because it, it it didn't correspond to to the ruling classes, right? And this, while of course corresponding to a dominance of the ruling classes and their their cavalry on the battlefield at some level, right? So that it, it is true, cavalry was important in Frankish military culture. It, as we've seen, rose in importance, but still probably. You know, hides some interesting developments, such as the fact that, for example, Roman mil uh, military units kept fighting in the Frankish army. You can see in Gaul since Caesar, you know, Germans being hired by the Romans to fight alongside uh, with the legionaries. Well, what, what starts happening fundamentally with the Frankish occupation of Gaul is that this uh, Roman military communities that were used to serve, you know, now generated, you know, by generation after generation after especially the Constantine reforms that were tied that there were specific families just performed the military activity they they lived as they had germanized also in, in, in lifestyle in this sense they they had grown you know hybridated the same goes for the Germans that had somewhat romanized in their style fighting in the Frankish armies and the interesting thing about it is of course that aside from entire Roman military units of the mobile army right not just the auxiliary uh, that remained in Frankish military uh, for some time. Even if you look at artillery, for example, it, we will have to make videos about that at some point. But uh, fundamentally, Saint Franks began to be, you know, uh, trained right in Roman military. I mean, to be trained properly as Roman legionnaires on their own. So. What you would see in you know Merovingian Gaul at this time, but the, the the establishment of the kingdom of the Franks is is properly that you you can't really tell who's who, right? It it doesn't make much of a sense by already by the fifth century say ah oh, this guy's Roman this guy's Germanic, right? It, they had the same equipment, right? Uh, stemming from different military cultures, in the Celtic one, the Sarmatian one, right? And all we see on the long run is an homogenization. And for what concerns armor, actually, uh, more in detail, by AD 296, the would-be Emperor Electus fought among his Frank's guards, dressed as they were, which, you know, the sources tell, in, in shirt or coat only, without armor. We are at an early date. At this point, the Franks have, you know, fundamentally emerged uh, as, as a proper confederation on their own quite recently. And this is still a moment in which you see that yeah, that this was the the average standard of, of a very few are when, when the Romans say, you know, you 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 find terms in in Latin like naked 
the strip and so on, it, 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 it doesn't mean literally that they had no armor at all, but it's obvious that the standard was like the the Roman uh, legionary average of, of the time. So evidently, of course, these people were poorer, they had less, you know, resources, they were financially more primitive societies, they had less, uh, you know, more archaic supply systems and so on. So they had less, they could be equipped with less, right? Uh, but even in here, the, the, the differences with the Romans are not so dramatic, right? We're talking about pre-industrial times, things didn't differ excessively. Um, the uh, of course the like the Germans of the time of Augustus they, they're literally in prehistory right they really are kind of an unspoiled tribal um, context we could also analyze anthropologically as you know prehistoric people but by the third century we are in a uh, in a different state right at this point the, the, even just the, the Germanic equipment starts including things that are as effective like the Angan as we will see now that has uh, or other javelins that have the same degree of penetrability of the Roman pilum. Uh, we're talking about the same armor. We're talking about, of course, loot. These peoples began to raid deep into the imperial uh, territory and they start seizing depots. Right, the, the Romans, you know, with, under time of Diocletian, especially, start you know centralizing towards the Mediterranean. All the also the armory production, etc., because they, they had the frontiers had become that unstable. Not just because of these incursions, actually they weren't an enormous deal at the time, actually the Romans coped with them fairly well, mostly also the same Roman usurpers that made, at, at this point, uh, of course, uh, extensive use of, of Germanic troops uh, all over, right? But we have to think of the Germans, we find the Franks, I don't know, Frankish piracy in the Black Sea. Uh, we find these guys actually doing the same thing that the Vikings would start doing later. Right, even in Frankish mythology, there's a connection with water. This idea, you know, that they, that they came from the sea, like the same Merovingians, uh, according to the legion, came from mar maritime monster. Like you know, Clovis would have been like for I think one one eight or one fourth uh, uh, a, mar a maritime monster, <laughs> something like that. Um, and like this, they participated. You know, think about the Anglo-Saxons. Think about the Litus Saxonic. I mean, these are somewhat overlooked dimension of that historical reality that were actually normal in the sense now we see it as a, a disruptive thing. But uh, you know, what's the empire's never faced piracy or uh, you know or mortars or things like this? Of course, during the late Roman Empire, this increased right consistently, but. We can also see in this regard that the thing, as you know, crumbled very slowly, right? And it contracted very slowly. And therefore, there is more this kind of Roman influence on the Germans than, than, than the country, right? You know, everybody whines, you know, the, the Roman fanboys, or at least those who think they are Roman fanboys, and that actually know nothing about Roman history, which is actually a very serious and beautiful thing. I think, oh, you know, the late Roman army got barbarized, what you know? As long as there was a Roman army, the the the, the thing that actually happened is that the barbarians got Romanized, right? And uh, even the changes uh, in uh, you know in the military standards, even if you look at the hip and say you know do not reflect the barbarization, they reflect you know an ad adaptation. As often we have explained, but I don't have to repeat it over and over again. But um, I mean, it, it's all part of uh, you know they may you know. What was Germanic at this point? Like, objectively, is there a single item that you can't qualify as Germanic? I mean, it's either Roman, or Celtic, or Sarmatian, and even in there, you know, what is this things in turn? But, you know, the Germans merged with a, you know, when a material culture fundamentally adopted and got stuff from, from, from others, you know, in a, in a broader sense, because they previously didn't have that, right? So, um, even in here, what are we talking about when we speak of barbarization proper, right? The Roman army basically, it, there is this mistake that is done that as if the uh, federati uh, were, you know, part of the Roman army. I mean, the federati, by definition, are not part of the Roman army. The federati are those who have a fetus with Rome, that is, they have an alliance, and they're foreigners, right, that fight on the Rome, right? So as long as there is a Roman army, there is a Roman army, and it's Roman, point. End of the story, the military standards are always high. They're always the highest compared to these populations, by the way. Um, 
And it's only when, uh, you know, the, the Federalists take over that, yeah, you don't see that there is no properly Roman state anymore. So there is not even a Roman army in that regard. But the, the blending here is uh, is debatable. And, and, and definitely the Romans had the upper hand on it. And as we've seen, the same Franks actually inherit an enormous amount of of military legacy from Rome. Right. And here we should open tons of digressions also on what actually Clovis achieved in his life, right, in terms of sheer strategic terms and what means he employed and how he managed to create the, this empire that stretched from the Pyrenees to, to the Amps, right? And, and the point is, you know, here you have an enormous amount of resources. Think about all the Atlantic coastal plains of Western Europe. I mean, that's basically... A, you know, agricultural resources that, by the way, at that time went exhausted on the long run. You know, the, the Franks do enter a crisis, you know, the same Merovingian kingdom eventually contracts on that same base because they had expanded so much, they had consumed a lot. But, well, the thing about the Roman cities, the infrastructure, it's the same Roman militias we have seen in the, in, in the video on the Merovingian army that there were lots of properly Roman people that participated to the Merovingian army as such, right, you know, as they had done under Rome. In the same identical way, these were the same people, the same military culture, the same techniques, the same equipment, right? And and the Franks basically are just next to them, and they they, they you know they leave together. They eventually, of course, uh, marry into each other, and they they become the the, the world we we know in, in medieval times. Um, and um, Agassius. Uh, that is one of the most quoted authors on the you know, equipment of the Franks, states that the armor was rare in Frankish armies in Italy by 1558, if I'm not wrong, when they, uh, the Franks basically, at the end of the Gothic War, exploited the fact that both, I mean, the Goths had been wiped out, Byzantines were exhausted, so they they had this, this you know, uh, genius, genial idea to, to, to raid uh, deeply up to, to, to southern Italy together with the Alamanni, and to eventually get crushed at the Battle of Casino, I think, I think it's 556, actually. Um, and they, and, and on this occasion, they are described, right, and uh, the, the the picture Agatius gives, however, is, you know, a bit prisoner of the traditions of Hellenic ethnography, which demanded the, the, the idea of the northern barbarians, like, like the Franks, to be described as half-naked, four-clad savages, right. Uh, you know, it, it, in part it's not excluded. We know they actually even wore four clads and stuff like that. But it's obvious that these were, you know, uh, you know, m more more organized and, and equipped armies than than we we think. And by that time, as we were saying before, by the, by the second half of the sixth century, you can't even tell the difference actually between a, a Roman cavalryman and and a Frankish one, right? In terms of at least of you know those who are the same level of. Of, uh, of heaviness, of weight, uh, in equipment, right? They use the same thing. What's the difference between a Byzantine Caballarius and a Longobard Arimanus, right? It, it, it's something that doesn't make sense to, to, to pose as a question by the, the mid-6th century. That, it, that is an answer you can't give only when you compare the military system as a whole, and then you see the differences. They're mostly collective training, organization, you know, and, and politics at the end of the day. Um, and Gregory of Tours describes his arch enemy, the Count Leudast, as wearing body armor in a helmet, carrying sword, shield, lance, and quiver. Right? Uh, Gregory, as we will see, is actually a source that says that the Franks made full use of cavalry of armor, so they, he doesn't have stereotypes of this kind. But his language is highly classical, and in this case, uh, maybe. You know, people say, do not take it too literally, but hey, what is he actually saying wrong? Uh, he's saying the guy has an helmet, carrying a sword, shield, lance, and quiver, everything matches. Right, say, quiver, why? Did these guys wear horse archers? Yes, they were horse archers. What do you think did the noblemen, like Leotas, did all the time they were not in war? They went hunting, and of course, every single nobleman ever throughout all the ancient medieval times knew how to use a bow on horseback. What do you, what do you think they, these guys lived like? Right? How do you think it's difficult for, for a guy that, that basically fights his entire life to, to know how to use a, a bow? Right? And, 
Look at the graves of Longobards in northeastern Italy. Look at even in Scandinavia. Like you can easily see these things uh, coming like crazy, like steps, um, uh, you know, by steps influence, but actually being rooted in the same local traditions. I mean, wh why wouldn't these troops use bow, right? And especially a noble, right? There is a bit this stereotype for the Germans that. Uh, uh, as we've seen that the Franks are taking a bit of, steer, uh, of the prototype by and uh, that is that they u made after all a contained use of of bow we will be seeing it now but the point is uh, as we we're saying before like, like where do we know this from like what kind of sources tell this story and you understand that these sources are in fact very you know first of all they don't actually say state that properly they, they just don't don't talk often about bows, and this has nothing to do about the fact whether they existed or not. Right, archaeology is, is, you know, unfortunately doesn't, uh, you know, have much of a organic uh, relics to to study. But the idea is that the, you know, why wouldn't be a bow used? Like it's something that exists literally everywhere since prehistory, and we know that these weapons were used. So yes. Um, uh, a, a Frankish count of, of the 6th century would of course be equipped with a full panoply according to, you know, old military standards of, of you know, civilized societies at that, at that point. Um, Gregory uh, of Tours, by the way, uh, uses one of similar, uh, another similar phrase about armor to describe a longobard champion in the, in the Frankish invasion of Italy in 590, uh, 590 the one we were talking about before we said the, the Byzantines and the Franks joined arms against the, the Longobards in Cisalpine Gaul. And in, in other several uh, other instances, he mentions body armor. So the idea is, even if the thing was not very uncommon. And um, in um, at least one case, it's clear that uh, he means male, right? That definitely was the, you know, most common form of uh, metal armor out there and there, there, there is also a list of items given in the Ripuarian law that was maintained especially in the eastern part of Francia uh, mentioning by the 6th century that mentions burning, mail shirt and leggings which would seem to represent some sort of protection for the legs perhaps the splint greaves which um, are known from other parts of the early medieval world. And actually, armor could be very complex, right? We know of, um, you know, even very, you know, inge ingenious um, uh, forms of armor we've, we've quoted before, the, for example, the ones of the Byzantine cavalry of Belisarius with wood uh, plates. Um, there was bone used, right? Yeah. Uh, this is like bone was used in armor up to you know look at Siberian tribes uh, from the from the 20th century the entire armor that are actually look identical to you know I don't know the the other ones of the, of the 6th century in form they're made entirely of bone right and we actually have evidence of lamellar armor right for the Franks as well right constructed from small iron plates laced together the top and the bottom that was found uh, in a number of Merovingian period sites in France and in Germany right and this type of armor was probably easier to make than mail actually and, and may well have been much more common than is often supposed right this is often um, you know uh, attributed to to the eastern world right especially in an anti-projectile function because apparently you know it's a huge debate about this actually but yes in, in, on average let's say uh, lamellar armor is of course more you know better suited to to stop projectiles and but th there are also lots of other you know qualities that it has the Romans used it in the West, of course, and uh, pretty much everybody did, like all in the British Isles, like it was everywhere, so we don't have to be dogmatic about it, and of course it was employed. And it seems to have been depicted on the seal ring of the late 5th century Frankish king Kilderic I, right? So, um, even in this case, uh, we, we are pretty sure about the, you know, 
the common existence of our, uh, among the Frankish aristocracy, of course, like any other people out there at the time. We don't find uh, a quantitative evidence for the lack of armor among the Franks, right? Or the lack of, you know, of cavalry, as we will see now. Uh, and, and the two things, as we've seen, are often associated, right? Because the Germans of the early hour, as you know, had effectively few cavalry, right? And in parallel, had a fewer armor because they had less resources. It's that simple. At this time, especially when the Franks settle in Gaul, the, the thing changes dramatically. Um, and Procopius, as his continuator Agatius, states that the Franks had fewer mounted warriors, right? But nevertheless, he makes clear that they did use such troops. Gregory of Tours, writing slightly later, states that the Frankish armies, as far back as he knew, deployed cavalry, often as the spearhead of their attacks. And once again, uh, here we have two different perspectives. Procopius wrote from a Byzantine uh, point of view. We could quote the Strategicon easily, and we made a video on the so-called blonde hair peoples, in which you know the same Franks fit, according to the pseudo Maurice, that actually talks of, of, of uh, an important role of cavalry among these peoples. Okay, uh, they said that it wasn't particularly orderly, right? The stereotype, as we'll see here, is that the Germans were fundamentally not well organized. They didn't like complex uh, battle plans. They tended to, to simplify everything in that especially cavalry charges were disorderly. Right? They, they actually had cavalry and they, they were extremely uh, impetuous in their charges. But as you know, you know, if you if cavalry doesn't have uh, an order, uh, a discipline, right, disaster is next door. And it's part of the reason why actually uh, the the Germanic warrior mounted and is mounted so, so easily. And Procopius, by stating that the Franks had, uh, you know, a few mounted warriors, uh, maybe refers to it in comparison to the Byzantines, that definitely at that time had more cavalry than the Franks, or at least they had also better standards in general of it. So there was this you know, uh, Byzantine pride in stating, oh, look at these barbarians. They, they have just a few cavalry, and maybe because he had seen them dismounting, right, but not because these guys couldn't effectively, or, or did effectively fight on horseback in, in other situations, right? And also here we have to understand, you know, what were these armies levied from? Because it's obvious that, um, actually, and this could counterstate what we just said, uh, when the Franks moved in, um, you know, from from the north to southern Europe, uh, it's obvious that these expeditions weren't just like the habitual, like uh, levies from northern Gaul that you know could serve like just a few days outside of their city walls. These were bands of professional troopers, or at least of martyrs, people that simply were more uh, more eager just to go out there to ride that were more apt at raiding, being faster contingents that of course made use of cavalry. This may also be a kind of two categorical statement. Uh, of course infantry was always out there and even you know the non uh, the non dismounted cavalry type uh, the troops typologies were quite similar, right? So even in here, it's probably a matter of quantity, and probably was, you know, in Frankish armies, cavalry was slightly less numerous than in Byzantine one, but once again, uh, you know, this may be just, you know, an approximation in some ways. Um, and also, of course, the fact that Gregory of Tours said, you know, cavalry has always been around here. Right, and let's consider, by the way, that, that Gaul also had its own equestrian tradition, not as much as Spain, for example, but still horses actually had been something back in the day, especially among the Gauls, um, pre-Roman uh, peoples, because uh, eventually, you know, the, the Roman domination flattened this local military traditions, but the idea of, you know, Celts also making use of, of cavalry since the day in France, uh, I mean, today's France still being uh, a good, you know, uh, horse 
uh, producer. Um, the Romans also having their own uh, cavalry units there, and uh, of course with um, uh, local breeds and you know supply system, etc. You know, made uh, the, the Franks employing what was part of a now uh, older equestrian legacy uh, in the area. So consider, by the way, that the, uh, the the Romans had all the you know the, the components, the technology, the, you know the uh, the, the equipment that the, the Franks had uh, somewhat inherited as well, but also they had known since older times. So actually, this idea that the Romans had this kind of heavy cavalry, think about the cataphracts, right? Uh, we've seen at Battle of Strasbourg how the Alemanni coped with that. So actually, the Germans knew how to to even deal with this cavalry since before even they could, couldn't could field them uh, on their own. Rome, you know, Late Roman cataphracts actually sucked. Let's let's be honest. If you look at every single employment that they made, right? You know, just um, they, they, they were a disaster somehow. Uh, they underperformed, but they, of course, they corresponded to to a mature and advanced equestrian culture that also owed, as we've seen, to the steppes much of of this influence. And the same Germans were exposed to the steppes. And think about during the you know. The Hunnic invasions, all of these um, Iranian peoples uh, like the Sarmatians, the Alani, etc., you know, that poured in into Western Europe, um, and that were already employed by the Romans as auxiliaries. Right? Think about the, all the Arthurian symbology of the sword in the stone, having to do, with, you know, the Sarmatian burial mounds, uh, etc. So these are all actually. Uh, you know, interconnections that we talk about now, because of course we cannot but talk about the relation between the Franks and the Romans, because the, the like, to make the long story short, this is all to, to realize that w- who are the Franks in the first place, because if we talk about just a Germanic population that lived in uh, today's Germany, roughly, you know, we know that there were roughly in some way that we have described also in other videos, but we're talking about now the Merovingian, sixth century Merovingian armies. We had, that's that's well the other thing. So there is nothing properly stereotypical aside from this bunch of passages that state, "Oh, look, they, they had the Angans." Now we will be reading actually. And in fact, we this weapon, the Angan, is described by Agassius uh, as a somewhat uh, a national weapon of, of of the Franks, or at least something. You know, typical of them. It was actually the Francisca you know, game kind of the, the, as a national weapon on the Franks, but it was actually not, right? Uh, we'll see it better later. But uh, Angonis are actually rare and connected, especially with noble graves, with rich, lavish burials. Um, the this weapon, you know, would, was essentially a javelin with corrugated plates, uh, would fall. Uh, out of use by the seventh century, right? At least in in, in Gaul, like these kind of weapons actually are to be found until the the end of the, uh, of the Viking era. Like if you look at places like Finland, etc., they 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 remain in this more primitive world of, of the north. But the the Franks actually abandon it, right? And the the idea is that already by you know the the, the fifth the sixth century this weapon wasn't much of a uh, you know much of a widespread one or at least it was a, a probably something more sophisticated than the average lance slash javelin right and Frankish noblemen um, were meant in this regard to, to use the the young gun in, in, a, in a flexible way because they seemingly changed the barbed spear into the young gun was narrow heavy head gave it the, enough trust to pierce Holbergs, right, and those shafts wound with iron could not be hacked off once it's stuck in, in cloth, armor, shield, or flesh. And this is the, the deal of the weapon, like it, it's uh, basically um, having a capacity to be employed both against armor and also causing this devastating wounds that, as you know, you know, having a corrugated blade means you basically cause uh, uh, a dirty wound, like if you have just a leaf-shaped blade, you just pierce through someone's muscle and then it comes out, and basically the the the, the flash closes itself uh, over uh, closes over itself, like uh, following the pattern of the 
you know the, the flat pattern of the of the blade. If you have a corrugated one, because these are random wounds that you know are all like uh, like the, your 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 flesh is all cut in, the, in an irregular way, and this forms sacs of of, uh, of oxygen where bacteria survive, and therefore the wound is more likely to, to get infected. And you know that at that time there was basically no way to save someone from septicemia or something. A great part of the people died sometimes even after you know weeks or even months um, of these complications after the the, uh, the, the combat. Right. Uh, of course, you can smash. It doesn't matter how these guys were, might have been covered in in iron, and you know that you could easily kill someone and cut, you know, uh, and uh, in some, you know, the, the the open spots and chop, etc. You know, on the spot. But really, especially the nobility, it was meant to fight for basically for all their lives. We're, we're naturally equipped in a way that would prevent, try to prevent as much as possible this kind. Of wound, um, so you can imagine all the types of internal trauma, like especially broken bones, right? These guys also the way they they fought, simply mounting, dismounting, you know, running, riding. Uh, you can imagine how times, how many, much times they fell, how with the kind of traumas and shocks that they got just from from a physical point of view. Aside from the mental one, they were, were devastating as well. But um, they. they they naturally were mostly uh, careful of not getting wounded, not having their 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 flesh cut, right? Because that was could really beat that. Um, and talking about the Francisca, right? It seems that at least the sixth century Franks made um, a much use of of this throwing axe. That is somewhat. You know, famous like the there are two general types appear in archaeology of the Merovingian cemeteries. There is a battle axe apparently wielded with one hand, uh, that is was like one for more for hand to hand combat, and the more famous throwing axe, the Franciscan, in fact, which Isidore of Seville uh, supposed had given the Franks their name, which doesn't seem to be the case. And the Francisca has a top edge of characteristically upswung reversed S shape. And the top uh, point has often been broken off by impact. And so the tests have also shown that the Francisca requires, of course, skill and training to use, uh, yet it had quite fearsome penetrating power. And it, it, it seems, however, so how did the thing get attached to the Franks? Well, it, this is interesting because if you look at, you know, the use of axes and throwing axes all over the, you know, the Germanic world, objectively, you know, every single German people used it, right? But uh, objectively, there was a concentration mostly in, in the Rhineland, in the Frankish, Alemannic, um, Thuringian area, right? Mostly towards, like, the Rhine and actually the most western side of the story. Um, and this axe seems to have developed actually in northern Gaul proper during the fifth century, and quite probably at least from prototypes common in the late Roman army. And it was not therefore an ancestral weapon brought by the Franks when they settled in this region. Also in southern England there are so there is a specific area um, that stretches from the Channel to to the Alemannic region, southern Germany. And the the idea I, I got over time is fundamentally that this thing was used mostly a, like an anti-armor weapon, uh, and that the fact it was concentrated in this area probably has to do with the the, the same Roman Germanic uh, frontier in, in a way, because this was some of one of the toughest areas where local warfare was based um, on this uh, mostly on infantry. In many ways, if you look at the Battle of Strasbourg, it's probably the most exemplary one of the whole late um, antique uh, warfare in the area. Like it was based on this massive chart, thickly packed charges of of uh, Germanic infantry against the Roman legions that stood also with you know this as you know brutally disciplined and tremendously equipped force uh, for which. Uh, and now we don't have time to digress much on it, but the idea is that they, the Germans pointed everything on, on, on the charge, right, on the mass charge, and if they, 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 to break only one, one blow, 
And these kind of weapons, just like, you know, the heavy javelins of the Romans, the same Germans developed, as we have seen, but also throwing axes, were used to have this to, to disorder, to soften up the enemy lines, uh, just before the, the charge, right? So you threw these things all at once, right? Because throwing them, of course, you can't imagine, you know, throughout these battles lasted hours, all stuff, you know, flying from one side to another in terms of projectiles of all sorts. But the idea is that the, you know, if you throw them all concentrated, you disorder the enemy at one point in a way that you wouldn't do if you threw the same thing, but, you know, in a longer, or over a longer time. Um, just to exploit in the following moments the, the disorder you have created and the same same tactic that the Romans used with their pila, right? Uh, so this is what actually the Germans start doing at this point. Like other peoples out there, like the Goths would use more cavalry, for example, or more sophisticated tactics, if you want. The Franks, the Alemanni, would use instead mostly this one because they, they concentrated everything on the infantry and, and therefore destroying axes were kind of like the ultimate uh, shielded armor breaker uh, and traumatic uh, projectile that could could help dramatically um, in this operation and that's in my opinion the idea like maybe all these archaeological finds we see is is actually the the, the picture of the of the Germanic fort to break uh, the, the 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 limits in many ways and and therefore this need of having anti armor weapon that could help to, to break through the, the Roman defenses. It's a bit, you know, controversial as a general, you know, a generalizing explanation, but I think it has to do with that and explains why, you know, this weapon needs to be found mostly concentrated in these times and places than other than others. Always bear in mind that, of course, battle axes were present pretty much everywhere, right? And uh, as we have seen, actually it seems that it, it was mostly a Roman Invention. So with, with it's the, I mean, not invention as a battle axe, but you know the the, I mean the, the Francisca seems to have originated specifically by by the Roman environment that uh, actually had the same problems in the sense that the Romans, as you know, fought continuously uh, uh, against each other as much as the Germans fought against each other continuously, and therefore they needed this kind of breaking armor um, projectiles, and this is very important because if you look at even I don't know in later times, for example, during the Viking era, when you know the, there is the empire, the Carolingians, that were a bit like that. I mean, the, the, surely that was uh, a world that had a higher degree of 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 armor protection on average in their armies, etc., compared to, to the Vikings that were much lighter on average. Uh, and of course, there is always the elite that has, but you know, complexively in terms of sheer, you know numerical proportion there is no comparison here and that's the same reason why you find for example um, uh, these I don't know the Danish axe being developed right uh, I, I don't know why uh, whether this is a good connection uh, the the thing of how the Danish axe is called the way it, it does it seemingly it's because you know the Franks wrote uh, our peoples kind of named it kind of randomly and then it became the Danish axe but what they actually know that that stuff wasn't actually developed mostly among, among the Vikings, maybe because of Frankish contact, right? And conversely, the persistence of barbed, um, you know, headed javelins, like you could find, especially uh, in the Baltic, uh, for for a long time, up to you know, it's, it seems like a relic of the migration era, where of course Western Europe had you know f far uh, gone past that. Uh, may be actually to do with the lower degree of uh, of armor that I in those poorer areas actually, uh, of course, is still was like the norm. Uh, and I, I think this has a lot in it. plus considering, however, that the you know the there was also this type of head that could pierce through armor as well. So uh, the idea that is being expressed is, is actually that the, the reason why this, this, this weapons was abandoned uh, is uh, because armor actually, uh, if we can say kept increasing uh, because during the 6th century, 7th century probably it reached its, its lowest uh, in it. But the elites uh, actually increased at that. I mean, the, the social certification increased. So in a way, these types of weapons, especially if connected to the nobiliar graves, the richer graves, could express the fact it was were more like noble uh, uh, weaponry, um, and we're talking about the Angon. But 
the point I was making is that the the idea of the Franciscan especially disappeared is is that it required kind of a, a looser formation, like a certain ability of movement, like you 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 must like throw it at a I don't know actually I've never tried never seen reconstruction in this sense, but I presume you need some space, some room to, to just to turn your your chest to swing your arm um, in a way you can't make, give a, a good throw, and this is. Naturally, in a thickly compact formation, a bit difficult to perform, especially if you have, you know, a you know fat, large shield in front of you, like um, you see the shield walls of later times, etc. So uh, the reason why this weapon is not to be found later, even if uh, that that would have been a good shield breaker, is actually that there was not much room to use that, and that at that point there were other uh, tactics mostly were employed, whereas the Francisca was, I mean, to solve the, the problem, whereas the Francisca was more part of this loser formation that is fundamentally collectively indisciplined bands of of ger average bands of Germanic warriors, because they were also the trained ones, the, the very well disciplined ones, but the average wasn't, you know, fought kind of a more scattered fashion, right, and even if they, they used this weapons as we've seen mostly in a collective function probably they they still you know had more room more space between one another to use it, it this is this is being used as a as an explanation frankly uh, and um, and in fact what, what you see even later on is that um, in spite of everything the the the, the the weapon the, this this idea of smashing through with the big javelin the big that doesn't find itself anymore uh, with a big uh, throwing axe, it's not out there, right? It's mostly about, you know, getting the best equipment in terms of a mm, solid sword and good armor and, and going there for it, right? Um, and uh, what, what it seems, though, is that the scrum axe increased in importance, right? Even, I, I don't know whether, you know, there, there was an actual replacement if the Franks used the axe, the, the Francisca in, in uh, let's say, uh, in alternative to, to the Scramus axe and vice versa. But it seems to me that they actually probably carried both. Like the Scramus axe, aside from the fact it can dramatically vary in length, like it could be just a little knife and, you know, to, to a saber of 70 centimeters long or even more, 80. Um, and it has various modifications. Is a, is a side weapon that you always bring with yourself. So you don't know like, unless it's that kind of saber that you use as a side weapon on horseback, you know, it, it's still, like, something you don't use, uh, preferably to, you know, your spear, your javelins, or destroying, or even, even an axe, actually, but it, it also depends on the circumstance, uh, and one, once again, on, on the size of the thing, uh, but, uh, the point, though, is that, once again, the Franks were not the only people to use Franciscus. They were, they were used by all the Germanic peoples. They were, they were used by the Roman army uh, or used later on by the Byzantines. It was something from the steppe. There were a lot of battle axes, for example, from, from the steppes area, also used on horseback. Right, so we actually have evidence of Francisca being used from horseback. Right, the, the Longobards did it. Authory, uh, Germanic king, was, was a Bavaria at one point. You know, he basically with his thighs rose up, you know, uh, erected on, on on the horseback and threw this uh he was he was idling like he was not moving but you know he threw uh, this throwing axe against the tree and hit perfectly uh and that's a good example of what an average uh you know germanic aristocrat was capable to do that is you know being perfectly skilled with all all these weapons and basically trying to compensate uh through this for the you know the the absence of a uh, much of a you know living in a in a broadly organized society that could use dramatic you know uh, least sophisticated tactics and something so that the valor of the individual was uh enhanced right of course the more civilization advances and the more armies become more effective because they drive from the away from the individualism of the warrior and they they kick the warrior's ass in fact with you know collective tactics which is you know individually you lose a lot because you're not capable of doing that stuff anymore that's why we see this mindset is kind of fire for, from our own because we we got civilized in the process but at the same time 
this with, with the resources of the time was really the best way of coping with the situation right so this dramatic and in, in dramatically intensive training that you start seeing at this point for example even in the Byzantine army right that naturally came from a wholly different background from you know uh, I don't know a Frankish chieftain uh, and and b war bands but uh, still had to to give this dramatic uh, skill in uh, horse archery in you know uh, sword uh, fancy and so on I mean and all together in one soldier it took like 20 years of training it was basically the military service per se uh, so the thing is uh, and there are many intersections right not just because many you know Franks also fight I don't know within the Byzantine army they surely did it was mostly like the Longobards did at that point but uh, it's simply because the same Byzantines sometimes start leaving maybe at the, the, the frontier of the empire in, in ways that were somewhat similar also to the ones of the uh, of the Germans in, in, in a way so also because some of them as we have seen were Germans themselves but this is another thing it's like the blending of a culture during the, the of, of all these different cultures during the migration era that that you find everywhere like for example the increase of mounted combat this capability of switching from one another is everywhere you find it in Europe uh, in uh, in the Mediterranean in North Africa in, uh, in Arabia um, everywhere and, and it's actually fascinating because it tells you even in this broader um, you know think that back in the day the Roman army had been that had brought together all of these peoples basically under the same under the same banner how probably the this the military legacy uh, had been uh fundamentally interiorized right and there were peoples like including the germans that grew up with rome like properly in, in their military capabilities so this is a good example um we also know interestingly enough this is not very much said uh, next to angons and a throwing axes, also throwing clubs, right? That are to be found in the early Middle Ages. For example, Isidore, bishop of Visigothic Seville, until uh, 636, is one of the single most important literary figures of the Middle Ages that uh, came to, to write a, a freaking lot, like an entire ens the Christian encyclopedia about all these various peoples, and through which we know, in fact even about this military digital sometimes have very you know completely invented but comments on Virgil's Teutonic clubs right that the Romans wrote of and it says the club the clava right in Latin is Hercules weapon so called because it is held together by iron nails clavis um, it is a foot and a half in length such is also the cateia which Horace calls caia it is a Frankish, uh, he, he says Gallic, as if probably, you know, from Gaul at this point, meaning where the Franks had settled, weapon made from the hardest wood. When hurled, being heavy, it won't fly far, but will smash with the utmost strength. Uh, if thrown by someone skilled, it comes back to him. This is kind of a boomerang. And thinking of this, Virgil says of the Abelians, wanted to fling clubs as the Teutons do, right? And uh, this is why the uh, the the Spani that here stands for the Visigoths actually, and 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 the Galli that is the Franks, called them Tautan, so from Teutons. So basically, here Isidore speaks of uh, the Teutons, and essentially connects the this thing to even to the current Visigoths and Franks of his days, right? So uh both these nations use throwing clubs as late as the seventh century AD and with smashing effect. And this is very important because actually the club is one of the first of all most ancient but also most used weapons um uh, in general for training. Right, you know, even the Roman legionnaires actually trained with clubs on a regular pace. Um, and it's of dramatic use because it has to do with skill, but also with force. Like it's uh, like even for for building muscles and stuff. Um, and it's a very important complement in the warrior's training. It's one of the very first things that is that was taught actually. So this 
think that, you know, say, what clubs meant, where you don't have anything more sophisticated and effective, well, you know, by the 7th, the 6th, 7th century, you know, that's what people had, right? Um, you know, metal was precious at the point, you know, people would starve to death if they lost one one agricultural tool because they couldn't find anything that could, you know, last that much for the, the work in the land. So, um it, it's really the context here that that it's to be taken in consideration, and we actually know of uh, clubsmen among the Germans. Actually, in fact, since ancient times, as you know, that's the still the source says, uh, because back in the day as well, that's sometimes all they had, right? You can't imagine actually most you know Germanic infantry at the time of uh, I don't know Varus of Arminius being equipped with spear, which actually uh, you know the first weapon ever, but, you know, then clubs, mostly, together with, you know, this minor weapons, like, you know, uh, knives and so on. But even in there, maybe they even have, didn't have much knives. Uh, they had stone spearheads still at the time, so think about it, right? Uh, this is wild, but real, as it gets. Um, and, um, Talking a bit more about tactics, um, there is this prejudice that, of course, we re fully reject the, according to which you know the the barbarians were people without military order, uh, like the unlike the the Greeks or the Romans, right? And indeed, collective training, uh, you know, was much lower than than the civilized peoples, in many ways, but. Um, the the myth that these uh, people's armies didn't have, for example, order, no formation, that were just a band of scattered guys, you know, wandering around and being overwhelmed by the more thickly compact f f drilled formations uh, of the Romans is is wrong. Actually, there was much less of a difference we we can imagine. Um, and a specific tactic that eventually would develop also. In, in the in the late Roman army, the, the so-called fulcon, right, the shield castle, whatever you want to call it, like shield wall in some way, but it's different. Shield castle means properly, you know, the idea that you know the shield wall is just maybe you have the guys having their shield in front of them and staying very, very you know compact and having with flat shields, something you can't do with curved ones. You just overlap them side by side and you go ahead trying to mostly. It's really mostly something for for stemming projectiles at that point. Telling the truth, this it's probably not for melee because in melee, the thing opens up, tendentially goes this more disorderly, and the guys have to to fight. Or of course there is much of overarm um, fencing was much more used than what people who make modern reconstruction pretend to claim as if you know. Uh, it's just because they they're not used to the thing and they're not fighting a real fight, right? You know, but. It was actually used, and it was uh, an actual thing. But the idea is that uh, the, the fulcon is something more, and it's something mostly uh, aimed at protecting from from. It's an extension of the shield wall in that regard, and aimed at shielding from projectiles, most right, because otherwise there is not much of a good reason to to cover yourself with with shields. Uh, and we find these tactics. Actually, the most famous is, I don't know, the Roman Testud, right? That, that was actually not a combat formation. Like, it was for, in fact, for approaching, you know, fortifications under fire and was literally, like, uh, you know, uh, it, it sucked as an option, but it was still the best in that condition if you didn't have any other protection of a fortification of your own. Uh, so it's just like an emergency uh, I, Tactic, but it's not even a tactic. But yeah, I mean, it's it's like a formation, most that was employed by many other peoples. But do you think that just the Romans had the idea of putting shields together? That's what literally every single infantry has done, historically speaking, um, uh, when having to stay under fire. The Celts did it. We the Romans tells us, or the Greeks. I don't remember. But in Hellenistic time, we we, have, we talked about it about Celtic warriors. But literally everybody does it. Even on horseback, that's feasible. Look at the Ottonians, what they did against the Hungers. At, um, I don't remember what it was, the Triade under Henry Favler or uh, at Lechfeld under Otto I, but still against projectiles, against the, the arrows of the Magyars. Um, so 
the as we were saying before, the Germanic peoples on average had lower armor than say the Romans. And the Romans actually did when they were the period we're talking about now is a moment in which the Roman army has actually topped its uh missile offensive capabilities like the, the Constantinian army is literally the, the most devastating military machine that the, the ancient world has ever seen like you, you you wouldn't like to have been in front of it right nothing to do with the, the one of the early empire this is something that I said over and over and over again because everybody thinks that you know that I don't know the, 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 the army the Roman army of the first second century AD was the best thing ever like look at the Constantinian army I mean seriously look at the fourth century that's devastating the Roman army never had, the Roman legion never had such an offensive and defensive capability at the same time. Ever. Like that. It was something utterly, monstrously devastating, right? You had never seen anything like that. And, um, and imagine being a, a Germanic warrior having to, to go out there, get you know, information against it, and being uh, showered with basically every kind of, you know, catapult, bolt, arrow, plumbata, all, all the stuff you can't ever imagine being thrown at you at, at one time so that's probably when the the germans probably implement on their own right this probably was not much of a traditional tactic either yes it was used as we've seen it by the celts possibly also by the germans before there was something like that documented actually in, in the wars of the early empire um if not even before um and as we were saying before it's natural but that was mostly done like where you know, especially in defense, like if the, the first charge had failed, so, you know, while you were surrounded, you kind of remained under the shields and then launching this last desperate charge. This is well documented for the, the Kells. Um, but now, it's been overly implemented because, of course, of the increased missile uh, capability of the Roman army. And the Romans are doing the same because, actually, they're fighting against other Romans, uh, they're fighting against uh, Persians, Sarmatians, so those guys really know how to shoot arrows uh, en masse and continuously end and that's something you need fundamentally um, so the shields castle f uh, formation uh, role is was the one to you know safeguard uh, you know the warrior and everybody around him uh, in, in a properly collective fashion right so um, the idea is that still uh, it was uh, a measure to to approach the enemy and to open the shield uh, castle at the last second and charge against the enemy, right? So basically suffering uh, as less losses, uh, as least, the least losses uh, in order to carry out the damn charge that at, as we've seen the Germanic, mostly infantry based armies were we're, we're betting on uh, exclusively, basically, to, to manage to defeat uh, a Roman legion. Um, and plus, we know, of course, of different ranks of troops. That is not to say, you know, just like different lines of, of the army, right? And we've seen it in Strasbourg, for example, the Battle of Argentoratum, where they, they came two lines, right? And the idea, of, of course, is the gradual fort. That's what the reserves are for, and of course, uh, it, it shows even in here that uh, the the mass charge is something you can't uh, always do, and that it's not even you know uh, probably the most preferable thing to do because the Romans know perfectly well how to cope with that. First of all, creating reserves on their own so that you know even if you manage to smash against the first line, the second is still fresh, and we have seen in the von Krieg series how you know. Uh, important uh, reserves are tactically speaking um, and how they can revert to fight so basically the, the Germans are obliged to replicate the same tactic in a way and, and to find a, a compensation for, for, for the two things consider that in that battle as we've seen before there were Germans fighting against other Germans including Franks right uh, so this is where these guys were coming from, which is naturally a very different, like with, you know, with this, you know, artillery, cataphracts, you know, uh, in incredible volume of, of, of missile fire. Uh, something very different from what the Germans are used to in their, you know, in their homeland. Uh, 
and and therefore this changes naturally even the way they they, they see the thing how what the world military organization is is about and no surprise that these tactics were actually in play ah, ah yeah now remember Ariovistus uh, the Swabian leader by 58 BC actually already enacted the, the shield castle formation right so we see basically uh, old and new uh, mixing together we think that Emperor Lothair's uh, boss uh, shows the double row shield castle still in use among 9th century Franks right so this is a tactic that is kind of universal in many ways as we were seeing at the very beginning like all the peoples employed and and that is conceived here probably uh, through the Roman uh, you know in, in multiple rows has to do with probably more like a, of a Roman influence than before uh, but this is speculative in some way just just understanding the logic behind right the logic behind it is that the Germans usually didn't come to grips with the Roman army in open field because they knew it was risky but at some point it had you know if you want to make war you, you must do it so in order to win fight and win pitched battles you have to cope and you have to evolve right and this is what the the, the Germans went through right through the during the centuries of contrast with Rome Right, and it took a lot, especially of defeats, to, to teach this to them. Like, uh, the whole thing was naturally uh, dramatic at the beginning because the the Germans simply didn't have the political cohesion to to even you know agree on a battle plan on a large scale because they were all different tribes, they all did the different clans, they did whatever they liked. Right, so there is a growth indeed of uh, these. Uh, military systems that is exemplified most and that probably is never fully gapped like you know all the populations that kept living in Germany look at the same Carolingians versus the Saxons for example uh, remained essentially what they had been it's those who come out there like the Franks in Gaul the Goths in Eastern Europe and then in, in Italy and in Spain that start uh, creating s and, and relying on, on, on something uh, different, right? He, literally, uh, in terms of military organization, I mean, Claudius' armies, as we've seen, is are not much of a product of a tribal society. They're properly Romano-Germanic armies, like that is. They're mostly based on the Roman military organization, um, and that's how he builds an empire, which other Germanic people builds an empire. The connection is evident, right? The, the cause uh, effect connection is quite even. Another aspect just to uh, talking about the Kunos, right? Uh, this is a term we find often which may mostly makes us think about the wedged formation and therefore many people say oh look this guy's used the Kunos this was a like a, a spearhead uh, formation in a triangular shape. Uh, really not because the Kunos was a term that over time had come past it from defining a tactic to, to a unit, right? So, uh, for example, Conius literally meant regiment in the Roman army in late antiquity. Gregory of Tours uh, uses it even in a sense of body of man, not even, you know, matter. It doesn't even matter what, how large this unit was, right? Um, and sometimes, in fact, with slightly disparaging undertones. Um, and Agatius describes a wedge at the Battle of Casilinum in 554, excuse me, before I said 558, 56, actually 54, because it's at the very end of the Gothic War, as a matter of fact. 535, 553, this happened the year after. And Agatius states that the center of the Frankish line during the battle was like a boar's head, right? Think of famous big snout formation, you know, thing you find over and over again, even among the Vikings, etc. Right? This is a common way of talking about wedge formation. But in this case actually um it doesn't seem like the like the, the thing was a a real wedge, right? You would expect a triangle at that point. It's rather possible like it really happened among the Germanic peoples at some point that, you know, they had kind of a, a rectangular formation like all others, but that's the 
objectively the center uh, the front was more loaded with the best troops, like the leader, surrounded by his troops, etc. And this obviously, uh, you know, reflects a kind of a wedge function, like a breaking, like a spearhead of, of the leader that has to break through. And that was praised for his courage, and literally, you know, uh, this mostly tied, this is interesting that Agassiz talks about it, because it's more like, uh, in fact, still a tribal tactic, in a way. Um, albeit it could be interpreted by some by the fact that this was a wall army with like the, the wedge formation, it's really not. So it might have actually even been produced by, you know, the center where the commander was advanced and the wings kind of remained behind because they didn't have enough, you know, uh, discipline and they weren't so motivated as the, the, the troops around the leader, so this formed like an arrow uh, shaped formation. So. Um, this is really difficult to 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 ascertain, really. But uh, we don't find much of an evidence of that tactics in, in kind of more advanced systems because, actually, when the cavalry comes to become the spearhead, as Gregory of Tours points out, uh, of the formation, the 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 old tactic kind of dy becomes more dynamic, and infantry is somewhat more subordinated to all these things. It's not what the original tribal warfare relies on. But it's definitely possible that there was still a relic, a reminiscence of this tactics in, in a way, uh, and that they were, they were employed. Um, and in general, talking about tactics and stratagems doesn't seem that the Franks made a, a good impression. Uh, especially to the Byzantines at the time. There's a bit this prejudice you find, especially in Procopius, but also in, in the Strategicon, as we were saying before, about the fact that these Germans are they're not capable of using ships, they're not capable of using siege equipment, their logistics sucks, and uh, they're not disciplined. They have a low collective training. It, it, it is in part, tr of course, due to, to imperial standards that this is our reality, but um, at the same time, it wasn't so you know, dramatically different as it seems. But there are several examples of Franks specifically also not just fighting against the Byzantines but against other peoples like Visigoths, etc. who seem to be falling for feigned flights, um, uh, also using them, a very few themselves, of course the thing was known, but doesn't seem there was much of a, you know, planning for it. Um, and this reflects something said in the Strategicon about the, the, the simplicity of their tactics after all, the, the broader Germanic tactics. Um, on some occasions they, they definitely were, you know, put themselves into trouble because simply they didn't use scouts, um, and they, they were generally vulnerable to this kind of stratagems that uh, instead other peoples, like mostly, in fact, the Roman Empire would, had been masters of. And this is a general prejudice, but it seems to have been a, a real thing, because mostly of a lack of organization and of pre-planned activity. Another aspect that we have seen before with the Tubantes in the service of uh, Julian, uh, Emperor, is this, in fact, uh, audio um, uh, experience that, you know, the ancient battle was really all one uh, in with uh, together with religion, right? The idea that the the sounds, these horns, think about the the Celtic Karnex back in the day, um, were all actually the, the voice of the divinity the resounding, right? The the songs of the ancestors, these um, uh, this call of the uh, protect, uh, you know, divine protector. And this was a custom that actually spread also within the Roman army, not just in the auxilia, but uh, among the same legionaries. There's the famous Barritus, for example, that the legionaries um, uh, shouted before the, the battle. Uh, the, there is this idea that the Roman legionaries were always silent and disciplined at the point you would never speak or make a, make a noise. This is actually not true, especially if you look at the, the beginnings, like in Republican times, the word this kind of things. But... Um, Objectively, during the migration era, it was a bit of reinjection of it because of the, you know, tactical changes, the um, the need to uh, naturally to revive in certain um, measures that that had always been there, but now were more functional. For example, to the charge for you know pushing this idea that 
you know, the, 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 the charge, for example, had gained importance and therefore you have to be determined, you have to prepare yourself. There is all an emotional balance that you have to reach before it in order to carry it out. Something very complicated it would be interesting to, 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 to deepen at some point. Um, <clears throat> and this thing was extremely common, actually, uh, even in later times. Like, for example, by the 9th century, we have the old High German Ludwigslied of 881, which says that when the Franks and the Vikings met, quote, song was sung, battle began. Right, so this was normal already at the time, still at the time. And, the, and already at the time, in previous times, in, in this sense. And um, we, we know, uh, also associated to those um, human sacrifices and rituals, etc., that 5th century Franks also worshipped, um, uh, of course, Walden or Balder as their war dance leader, right? So, and it, it, it's dramatically fascinating to think that the famous style from Grazan in the heart of France portrays Jesus Christ as a weapon dancer. Right, we're talking about uh, this word masked dances, right? We we find this, um, you know, emblems, representations. For example, the Frankish king Kilderic died 481, 82, may have had a mask hanging from his spear, right? And we've seen um, war masks w were a thing uh, that has even deep roots. It's not just merely defensive thing. We made a, a video on Roman battle masks. Um, and we we observed mostly the the, the, the meaning, the the, psycho, the psychological side of the story, not just the material one, right? Jesus Christ represented as a weapon dancer in, in the mindset of a barely Christianized Frank, right? He is, it expresses what the whole thing here in this military context was about. It was really about believing that the world gravitated around war, that the day of the sky was fundamentally a, a military one, that Christ, you, we, we made a, a video that is um, cr uh, the cross rising in blood, the sacralization of, of the of the Merovingian monarchy, go look at that, because that speaks exactly of these times, 5th, 6th century mostly, um, and how properly Clovis and his descendants created this uh, mix of, you know, of, of a religiously and military founded um, legitimization for their own personal rule, right? You know, e overly emphasizing this military, this uh, bloody side of the religious aspect. The idea that blood was the life, that it had to be shed, and emphasizing in the songs, in the symbolism, this this bloodshed as a justification for their military expansion and, and these are things that you can find uh, centuries and centuries later still when the Carolingians were trying to, to convert the Saxons and showing them Christ as a comitatus uh, chieftain fundamentally with the apostles uh, like his retinue and emphasizing the bloody passages of, of the Bible like the one St. Peter cuts off the ear of the guard that came to, to, to arrest uh, Jesus so all of these aspects that have to do with a with a, with a society that we see it, we see it actually from their art, from from their uh, imagery, from how they saw the world like in, in visual representation. This was like uh, the heaven or hell for a psychiatrist. Like the 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 the, the, the picture of the world was dominated by violence, by, by math, you know, human figures torn apart by the, you know, universal um, uh, snake, this, you know, brutal, dark, uh, hopeless vision, this, uh, of the dramatic destiny of the world. Look at all the sagas, the, the Germanic epics, that's what the thing pointed at. These people were, you know, framed now in a in a different environment like Roman Gaul could be and you know of course you know gradually abandoning their, their ways of life etc but you know remaining for actually much more much longer than we think imbued with the sense of uh, of military um, raison d'etre for for the freemen that that actually flowed mostly into the, the the Frankish nobility and that caused much of what we we know as the the 
the military ethos of chivalry and as in its dark side, its non-idealized side, and it was still alive, in, and it's still alive today, in, in many manifestations, in, in a way we, of course, we, we haven't been able to discipline, to, to rationalize ourselves to, to a much more effective uh, destruction as the one we have today, but that, uh, you know, in this case are much more instinctive and therefore much more much closer to to the reality of mankind, uh, aside from the artificiality of the society we have created. But this is yet well another thing. But uh, it was important, I think, for just to point out that that the mindset here is the probably single most important aspect to to, to frame first, and also the most difficult one to understand, to try to understand. Uh, we know. Uh, that also another aspect of the at least of Frankish appearance uh, could talk about clothing, the stripes that we find. Maybe there is a continuity, maybe in fashion from the Gallo-Roman one to, to the Frankish clothing in the sixth century. But there is this ethnic tribal element of the of the hairstyle that uh, defined in the absence, for example, of uniforms. Think about it. You know, who was who. You know, in uh, think about you know ancient Germany. How how do you think these guys could could recognize themselves, uh, given the you know the the lower collective standards in general, the organization of recognition? Well, there were many ways, but uh, as you know, for example, the Swabi tied their hair into a knot at the side or on top of the head. Well. So did the Franks, whose kings in peacetime let their long hair down, parted in the middle, but before going to battle, braided and knotted it on the side of the head. Right. So you see, even here, the practical function, the in the Germanic world, and this also was inherited by uh, European chivalry. You know, the the hair represented in many ways the virility of mankind, to, of, of the man, to, together with the sword. Um, and therefore, the thing was all one, and long hair were a symbol of, of beauty, of strength. You know, it was a value. For example, the idea of being beautiful was a virtue. Um, and yet, obviously, you know, uh, long hair, a uh, bit, you know, complicated to maintain. And therefore, they, at least they knotted it on the side of the head when they went to fight. And this was the, their way of recognizing themselves. Other peoples had other ways to recognize it. For example, the longbirds did the same thing with the, you know, the hair parting on the forehead, but having long beards and, and being completely shaped on the nape. Uh, other P, th there are this th this kind of distinctions that um, actually b by the point of the 5th, 6th century probably began to fall, fall of use. Consider that the, the Franks already at least uh, consider that the Franks more than other populations, especially after the creation of the Merovingian monarchy remained without uh, a, a true, like, let's say, the tribal identity was was um, taken over by the, let's say, the national one of the Franks, um, and therefore also these customs, of course, diluted because you know, the, the, doesn't matter how the Belgica had gone depopulated, but still it was more dramatically inhabited than, than all what the Franks could oppose. Well, well, it seems that they had actually. A, some solid ethnic impact in some areas of northeast of Gaul, but um, still the, the were the minority, and therefore in a few generations, uh, well, maybe not such a few generations, but considering other people settling down, I mean, they, they dramatically changed their way of life, at least. So even these customs uh, on the long run were, were lost, right? And But in here there is probably the affirmation of of an aristocracy and of an impoverishment of the freemen that in Gaul was dramatically quick uh, at many levels but we will see it another time maybe and pro probably in a video talking about Frankish cavalry of this time which I think is even more fascinating and because these are the new protagonists of the story in many ways um, and they are a bit more for you know um, for the Franks than the other Germans. So the tendency uh, in early medieval times is uh, is to the stratification of society and the impoverishment of the lower classes, right? And uh, this is 
where cavalry effectively stemmed from in the way we start knowing it better from the high middle ages as the the leading arm but in any in any case we have seen that also by the 6th century the thing had begun in some ways by the way well, there would be so much to say also in, in relation to the continuity with Roman times and discontinuity with Roman times, but let's stop it here because, telling the truth, I don't know how these videos come out, but, uh, you know, probably they're, they're exhausting to, to listen to. Uh, but you understand how um, shaded, like, well, this world thing is and how, you know, what I care mostly about is, is trying to reconstruct from military changes the the political and social ones and and vice versa right so because without that you say but you know why does this matter you know why do people change like uh why why do people fight differently go to die differently well that's all what we should think of in the sense that given the clause of its trinity you can't understand the world without war as much as you can't understand it without politics and society. These three things go together. If you eliminate just one side of the story, you pretend that, I don't know, war is not important, it's not worth it. Okay. You you refuse to understand the world by, by definition. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, this is what we're doing in Schwerp, trying to, to widen the, the awareness on this side of the story and trying to be, um, you know, at least careful for accuracy and stuff, but naturally talking about all lots of, of things together, I don't know, may turn out confusing. I try to, you know, at least complete, to cover lots of things in, in, in these videos because they, they can also overlap with others we made. I don't know, we talked about Ostrogothic archers, uh, Longobard infantrymen, uh, we'll keep covering this all uh, on the long run. And uh, just for now, we stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now. I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time, bye.